well, thank you. Um, as the final speaker, it's my distinct pleasure to thank the organizers for putting on this excellent event, especially our local organizers, Fred and Molly. So please let's <laughs> thank them all. So following the lead of a uh, previous talk, I probably should have entitled this uh, talk as now for something completely different. This will not make any reference really to my preceding talk, so if they made no sense, I have another opportunity to make no sense with you. I should say, uh, just before I go on, uh, you can already download the slides at this URL. One problem I find when I give slide talks is stuff tends to kind of fly off the screen and then no one remembers what I said. The other advantage of uh, having put this up is just psychological for me. See, now when I look out in the audience, if I see people you know, typing on the computers or looking at their phones, I think, ah, they're just looking at what I, want is what I said on slide five. <laughs> OK, so I want to talk about today, um, in my first two talks, I, I mean, uh, as was said when I was introduced the first time, um, I got my PhD sometime in the last millennia. And uh, in the years I've been doing this, there's been tremendous progress in the study of three manifolds. Two parts of that I've already mentioned. Perlman's proof of geometrization in 2003 um, and the proof by Egal uh, and Wise of the virtual Hawken conjecture in 20, 2012. Uh, it's another, though, major breakthrough I haven't talked about, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, um, and that's the role of floor homology uh, in the study of three manifolds. So floor homology is something that comes out of gauge theory and symplectic geometry, um, and from there comes out of mathematical physics. Um, it's something that had huge impact on the study of four manifolds in the 90s, uh, work of Donaldson, cybert witten invariants, and so on. And although there was always a parallel theory for three manifolds, uh, there weren't many uh, results, uh, perhaps simply because we knew more uh, going in about three manifolds. So you have to work harder with a new tool before it becomes, becomes useful. But that all changed uh, in the 2000s. Uh, with the work of especially Oslav Zabo uh, and Kronheimer and Morafka, who, who built floor theories for three manifolds, uh, which in fact can be worked with uh, by people who don't do PDEs. Um, and in particular, the, the Hagard floor homology of Oslav and Zabo is a very concrete, actually computable thing um, and has had uh, big consequences. Uh, in particular, I'll give some examples of what it's good for later. So today I want to talk about a, a conjecture. There'll be no, certainly no proofs, no theorems, really. Um, and it relates three things, uh, none of which have made an appearance in this um, conference so far. So I'll spend the first half hour just telling you what these three things are. Uh, floor homology I've been going on about already, uh, orderable groups, and, and then taut foliations. And I'm going to tell you about a conjecture that's been formed over the past 10 years, uh, which, um, just to be upfront, I don't believe. Uh, and this is uh, really just an account of my failure to disprove this conjecture. All right. So to get started, uh, the context is I'm always going to be thinking about a closed, uh, irreducible three manifold whose rational homology is the same as the three sphere, so rational homology sphere. Um, and then the conjecture that I alluded to is the following. Of course, again, none of the three terms are defined. That's no worries. Um, for an irreducible rational homology sphere, the following three things are equivalent. Uh, the first is that the Hagard floor homology, whatever that is, is non-minimal. Uh, the second thing is that the fundamental group of Y uh, is left orderable. And the final thing is that Y has a co-orientable top foliation. So I want to go ahead and just spend half an hour telling you what these three things are and some of the connections between them. Any questions? OK. So what is Hagard floor homology? Well, I'm going to say almost nothing about how it's defined. No, I literally will say nothing about how it's defined. Uh, all we need to know today is that the simplest version, called HF hat, is just a finite dimensional vector space over the field of two elements. Um, it's part of 
a three plus one dimensional TQFT, not quite a TQFT, but again, it's the last talk, ignore all technicalities. So in particular, it's something that, you know, it associates a vector space to a three manifold, and then if you have a cobordism between, between two three manifolds, so a four manifold, then you get a map from the uh, vector space associated to this to the vector space associated to that. So there is a corresponding four manifold invariant that will uh, play our role. So the first major application of uh, these floor homology theories, this is actually the monopole version of floor homology. Again, no worries. Um, in 2003, Kronheimer, Rothka, Osloff, and Zabo uh, showed, uh, this is a question has been open for a long time, that uh, no Dane surgery on a non-trivial knot in the three sphere yields uh, RP3. So right, if we have the trivial knot, then I guess maybe I haven't talked about Dane surgery, so let me quickly describe. Right, you have your knot, it's very simple in this case. You take a net regular neighborhood of it, which is a solid torus. You remove that solid torus, you put it over here. Uh, and then you say, on second thought, you should reattach the solid torus to form another closed manifold. Um, you do so uh, in such a way, okay, that this meridian disk on the solid torus you remove, it doesn't go right back in where, you, where it was. I mean, I guess you could, you just get S3. Uh, but instead, it goes to some other curve. Like maybe it goes to the curve that goes around twice. So if I do this particular Dane surgery on the three sphere, or sorry, on the unknot, uh, then I get RP3. And um, what these guys proved is that uh, this is the only way that you ever, ever get RP3. Uh, and one of the things that's great about Hagar floor homology, I mean, this, these kind of Dane surgery questions are, are, go back a long way. Um, and there were certainly the Thurstonian um, tools, hyperbolic geometry, and and then things that uh, just appeared in Ahn's talk, like character varieties and so on, they have important things that you can say about Dane surgery. But there are certain classes of questions which have been sort of completely impenetrable from the point of view of sort of hyperbolic geometry. Uh, and fortunately, we have this sort of orthogonal tool which allows you to answer, answer some of them. So there's been a lot of consequences of uh, this, this theory. For us, uh, I'm really only going to use the following basic fact, uh, which is that even for the three sphere, uh, this vector space is non-trivial. Uh, it's one dimensional. And uh, for RP3, it's two dimensional. And in general, its dimension is bounded below by the size of the first homology. Uh, and so we're going to distinguish the manifolds for which this inequality is an equality. Uh, and I'm going to call those L spaces. Uh, and so examples of L spaces is any manifold with a spherical geometry. So in particular, a lens space is an L space. And that's from whence they get their name. Um, some examples of uh, non-L spaces. If I do uh, 1 over n Dane surgery, so that's something where um, you're going, what's which way? Always dangerous. Uh, you're going around. Yeah, once around this way and many times around this way. Um, then uh, if you do that on any knot in the three sphere other than the unknot in the trefoil, you get one of these uh, non-L spaces. Uh, other questions? All right, so that was thing one, uh, Hagard floor homology. Uh, thing two uh, is just some algebraic notion. So if I have a group G, a left order on that group is just a total order on its elements, uh, which is invariant under left multiplication. So in particular, if you have element g less than h, and you pick another element f, then f times g has to be less than f times h. So the basic example of an orderable group is just take the real numbers, uh, viewed as a group under addition, and take the usual uh, notion of less than. Um, or, I mean, here we're going to be thinking about mostly uh, countable groups, so maybe uh, Z is a better example. And 
Uh, it turns out, that, let's say for example, free groups are left orderable as are, as are braid groups. Um, what are some groups which are not orderable? Well, finite groups uh, are not orderable. That's because see, torsion causes problems. Right, let's just say that I had a, an element of order 3 and you know, I have g is bigger than 1, let's say. Um, so, I, so here I've got g is not the identity, but maybe its cube is the identity. Uh, so if I take this thing, by left invariance, this tells me that g squared is bigger than g. And by left invariance, this tells me that g cubed is bigger than g squared. Uh, and now by the property of orders, g squared is bigger than g is bigger than 1. So we just learned that g cubed, which I said is 1, uh, is bigger than 1, violating that it's an order. So I wrote finite group here, but in fact any group with torsion uh, does not, is not left orderable. Um, another example to keep in mind uh, from Gregory's talk yesterday is like SLNZ. Well, I guess SLNZ in fact has torsion, so that's a subgroup, uh, I mean, sort of a subclass of what I was just talking about. But in fact, any finite index subgroup of SLNZ is not left orderable. So it's kind of a higher rank uh, lattice phenomenon. So for the groups I'm going to be thinking about, three manifold groups, uh, they're countable. And for countable groups, it turns out that being left orderable is equivalent to being a subgroup of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the line. Um, and the idea is. Roughly, if we have a group G acts on the line preserving orientation, then how do we define an order on it? We just pick a base point and then say that define uh, G is bigger than H exactly when uh, g of x0 is bigger than h of x0. And OK, you have what if there's something fixes x0? You have to refine this, but that's the, the basic idea. And in fact, I mean, if you're more sort of geometric term of mind, you might as well just take this as the definition of order. Uh, it's just a subgroup. It's just a group which acts faithfully on, on R, the simplest sort of one-dimensional manifold you can think of. Um, and so I'm, as I said, interested in when three manifold groups are orderable. Um, and so just for uh, ease of notation, let me just say that a three manifold itself is called orderable uh, when its fundamental group is left. Other questions? OK, so that was item two of three. Um, for the third one, um, is the notion of a, a taut foliation. So this is a, we have this closed three manifold. This is a foliation of the manifold into two dimensional leaves. Um, there's some kind of assumption about smoothness. Uh, let me not belabor this, uh, except to say that this is like the minimal level of smoothness you could possibly uh, work with. Um, so anyway, you know, you have these charts that are horizontal things and overlaps, and so you can talk about how smooth it is. I said I wasn't going to say anything about it. I lied. So we have this two-dimensional foliation, and um, I'm going to insist that that foliation be co-orientable, um, so that there's a n preferred normal direction to each of my leaves. Uh, that's equivalent, since my manifold is orientable, to saying that the leaves are orientable. Uh, and then, uh, so that's we have a foliation, and then there's this additional condition, uh, which is that there's some loop, which is transverse to uh, the foliation, which meets every leaf. So what are some examples of taut foliations to keep in mind? Well, one example is just a three-manifold that fibers over the circle. Right? If I 
I always draw too many fibers when I do this. All right, so here's my vibration, nice foliation. It's easy to find a loop transverse to it, which meets every leaf. Uh, this is, in fact, really kind of a bad example because the leaves here are all compact. Uh, in the examples I'll be talking about, none of the leaves will be compact. So what's maybe a better example uh, is to take uh, R3 foliated by, by planes of a sort of by irrational planes. And for that, I mean, maybe it's easier if I draw it a dimension down. Right? If you have, a, if you think about your torus um, as the quotient of Euclidean space, two-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, so here's my energy lattice. If I pick an irrational number like the square root of 2 and then look at the foliation of this of Euclidean space by lines of slope uh, root 2, then that's, of course, invariant under the translations. So that descends to a foliation of this thing. where these leaves wind around, but they never, they never close up. Uh, and so that's a much better, it's a better model for, for the kind of foliations we're, we're dealing with. Um, and so this, this condition here, part C, maybe I should say, uh, what are some non-examples of, of top foliations? So um, in fact, the, the part here of the definition, which might seem like an afterthought, is actually the linchpin. So any closed oriented three manifold has a foliation satisfying these two conditions. Right? So even the three sphere has a perfectly nice two dimensional foliation with orientable leaves. Um, it turns out that when you add in this additional condition, it seems very mild, but Somehow, the way I like to think about it is it somehow forces the transverse dynamics of the foliation to be complicated. Um, and so therefore, you sort of get extra tools which, which force a lot of structure, actually. Uh, it seems like it doesn't, but, but in the end, it does. Um, so for example, if you have a taut foliation of a manifold Y, uh, then its universal cover is either the three sphere or S2 cross R. Um, so in particular, uh, one property you have if you have a top foliation is the fundamental group is infinite. So here I'm always going to be focused on uh, an irreducible three manifold Y, which means my universal cover, if I have a top foliation, is just going to be R3. Okay, so that's opposed to um, something else. And uh, so in particular, you should start maybe thinking about like hyperbolic manifolds or Euclidean manifolds or something. Uh, but there are plenty of hyperbolic manifolds that don't have these top foliations. Um, so the hyperbolic manifold of least volume, called the Weeks manifold, turns out to admit no, uh, no top foliations. That's a, a result of uh, Roberts, <coughs> Shurishian, and Stein. So those are the three things. Uh, the Hagard floor homology, uh, group orderability, and top foliations. So are there answers, are there, sorry, are there questions yeah, before? Yeah. Yes? Do you have a question on that example you just Yes. Said. So what would be the simple closed curve just to standardly check? Right, the simple closed curve in my picture. Right, so I mean if I draw this. Yeah, exactly. So it's basically upstairs, it's that curve. Exactly. No, no, please. That's right. Okay. So let me talk now about the uh, conjecture, what, some of what we know about it. So the conjecture relates three things. Um, there is not being an L space. Right? So that means you have some interesting floor homology. Uh, there is your fundamental group being orderable, which I can think of as saying, uh, I'm writing it here sort of geometrically, the fundamental group of Y acts 
on R. Um, and I should say, in this diagram, uh, all actions are assumed to be non-trivial and preserve orientation. I don't want to keep saying that. So actually, this, this then sounds weaker than being orderable, because I'm just saying it has a non-trivial action on R, whereas orderable means you have to have a faithful action on R. Uh, but it turns out, basic foundational lemma of Boyer, Rolfson, and Wiest says that actually, in the three-manifold context, you can promote a non-trivial action to a faithful action. So never have to worry about that. So, and then the third thing that the conjecture asserted was equivalent was having one of these top formations. Um, and uh, between these things, there's actually only one theorem. Uh, that's a theorem of Adsoth and Sabo, which says that if you have a top foliation, you get some interesting floor homology. Um, and uh, this proof involves the work of uh, Ellie Ashberg and Thurston. So you have this top foliation. Uh, so if you think about its tangent plane field, right? that's a nice integral plane field. What Ellie Ashberg and Thurston showed is you can perturb that to a plane field which is everywhere non-integral. So in other words, it's a contact structure. Right? So once you say the word contact structure, you think symplectic manifold, you think gauge theory. Uh, and that turns out to be enough to um, get you started uh, going here. And there's a. Ellie Ashberg and Thurston assumed their foliation was C2. Um, and most foliations you actually encounter in the real world are not C2, it turns out. Um, so some recent work of Bowen and uh, Kazez and Roberts actually extended Ellie Ashberg and Thurston. And so that's why I wish to give them credit there. Um, there is a, so that these two things were conjectured to be equivalent by uh, Boyer, Gordon, and Watson in a recent paper. Um, I'll say something about the evidence for that part in a minute. So that's uh, what we know. Again, it doesn't seem yet that there's, OK, now at least these two things are connected, right? A implies B question, B implies A. Uh, what's this thing doing over here? Well, turns out that having a taut foliation doesn't seemingly give you an action on R, it does give you actions on other one-dimensional things. Okay. So uh, in particular, um, let's start here. So if we have a taut foliation, I said its uh, universal cover is going to be R3. Um, and it turns out it's actually R3 foliated by planes. Okay, so each in the universal cover, you get a bunch, you have leaves downstairs, and the fundamental groups of those leaves inject into the fundamental group of the manifold. So upstairs, uh, you just see their universal covers. So here you see in the universal cover R3 foliated by planes. Um, and then you can form the leaf space in the universal cover. So collapse each plane to a point. Right. Um, and what you're going to get is, uh, well, a simply connected one manifold as long as you're willing to allow your one manifold to be non-Hausdorff. I mean, the simplest picture you might get in the universal cover would be the thing you got for uh, a manifold that fibers over the circle. Right? If you think about a manifold that fibers over the circle, its universal cover is just the universal cover of the surface cross R, and you just see this stack of planes, um, and then the leaf space is just, is just R. But uh, in the general... Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Does, does the transverse curve hit each leaf only once? No. Upstairs, yes. Downstairs, no. Downstairs, it meets. The, the, the leaves are dense downstairs. So if you take any single leaf and you take its closure, that's everything. Yeah, that's why it's sort of dynamically interesting. Could you say a quick word about non Hausdorff one manifold? Yes. Um, so the, the idea is that, OK, your universal cover. Well, it's R3. I'm going to draw R3 as the interior of this blob. And I'm going to view this as foliated by things that are just, well, they're just horizontal from our perspective. All right, so that's a nice foliation of this open, this is supposed to be an open ball. Um, and if I form the leaf space, of this thing, collapse the leaves to points, uh, what I get 
is the following um, following manifold. Uh, well, not well manifold. Following object, uh, you have, or maybe I'll even sort of draw it inside, right? So you're going to have. Um, let's see, which way do I do this? Right. So this is like critical height here. These things don't quite meet. Um, and so at this height, you sort of have a. This side, your leaf space. These guys just collapse to an open arc. These guys here, they collapse to an open arc. And then there's another open arc. This goes from here down to here. That meets each one of these leaves once. Um, and the topology, which I didn't, of course, tell you about the topology on, uh, for le on the transverse space, but it comes from transversals. Like so, you have this little path here, which is transverse to the leaves. That should give you a, sort of a chart on the, um, the leaf space. And so that chart says that in particular, like these points here, this actually is a single um, uh, open, open interval in this manifold. So in particular, uh, this is the manifold that you get by taking two open intervals and identifying two open subintervals. So it's locally homeomorphic to uh, R, but it's not Hausdorff. So at the critical level, are there two leaves? There are two leaves, absolutely, at the critical level. Right? Because it's sort of it's supposed to be open. So it'd be like two open disks almost meeting at a point. Um, so this picture is uh, deceptive in the fact this is way, way too simple. Right? Because we have the fundamental group of our three manifold, which is probably like a hyperbolic group, acting on this picture. So really what I should have drawn, and you'll forgive me probably, I hope, for not having done so is that really this branching that you see um, should be some kind of fractally type thing. Um, and so what you're going to get uh, when you take the um, leaf space is some kind of uh, yeah, non-Hausdorff, simply connected one manifold. If you Hausdorffify it, then what you're going to get is you're going to get an R tree. That's another way of thinking about what the leaf space is. If the foliation is really nice and simple, you just get R. It's a nice case. Um, so anyway, you do get, if you have a top foliation, you do get an action on a simply connected one manifold, which sometimes is R. So sometimes there is an arrow which goes up here. Okay. Uh, that's action number one. Uh, the second action is something called Thurston's universal circle. Um, so. Assuming, let, let's assume for simplicity our manifold Y downstairs is a hyperbolic manifold. Uh, then a theorem of Kandel says that you can find a Ramanian metric on your three manifold so that each leaf of your foliation is actually hyperbolic on the nose. Right? It has, actually has constant curvature minus one. So when you pass the universal covering, you pull this metric back, you have this foliation of R3 by planes, and each plane is actually isometric to H2. Right? And so as a copy of H2, it has a circle at infinity. And it turns out there's a way to sort of amalgam these circles at infinity together by some kind of inverse limit process uh, to get a single circle called the universal circle. Uh, and because your three manifold group acts on its universal cover, you end up with an action of the fundamental group of M on this, on this universal circle. Uh, Thurston never uh, published his proof of this. Uh, there's an alternate proof uh, done by myself and uh, Danny Caligari. But anyway, you get an action on the circle, which is, again, a one-dimensional manifold. Um, and well, I guess you know, if you have an action on R, you get an action on the circle. Right? If you just think of uh, if you have an action on R and you want an action on the circle, just say, eh, act on this thing here as you were doing before and fix this point. And you know, sometimes, if you have an action on the circle, you can lift it to an action on R. Um, that's like saying the associated circle bundle has a section. There's an obstruction for that. Um, so there's some kind of connections, some of the time, that allow you to go from here uh, over to here. And I think that's, that's sort of what we know 
about this conjecture uh, in terms of, of sort of universal statements. Other questions? What's the motivation for the conjecture of Boyer, Gordon, and somebody? Uh, Boyer, Gordon, and Watson. Uh, yeah, so um, the conjecture, the, the motivation is it happens in a lot of examples. Um, and the, uh, the thing is, so for very, for really simple manifolds, like you start with cipher fibered spaces. Cipher fibered spaces turn out to have top foliations exactly when, sorry, cipher fibered spaces turn out to have top foliations, um, and those top foliations can be chosen so that their leaf space is just R. Okay? Um, and so in that case, you actually do get an arrow, an arrow going this way. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Who, I mean, this, uh, this conjecture is relatively recent, but people have kind of been thinking about this um, for, for a while. Um, but I, I don't think there is intuition. I would say to the extent there's any intuition, I, the stuff down here. Other questions? About the bottom arrow? Yes. Uh, the question is, is it expected if you have an action on the circle, you have a top foliation? Uh, that is um, not true. So it's known, yeah, so it's known that uh, there are three manifolds which act faithfully even on the circle, uh, which are, do not have top foliations. Yeah. Right, so that's... So somehow, if you want to believe this conjecture, you start wanting to believe that some of these arrows can be inverted. But this one definitely can't, which might make you suspicious of the whole conjecture, as I am. Uh, despite my suspicion, or my prejudices, or whatever, there's actually a ton of evidence for this conjecture now. So um, last year, combining the results of Hanselman, Rasmussen, Rasmussen, and Watson with results of Boyer and Clay, uh, it's known to be true for all graph manifolds. So anything that's built up of cipher fibered pieces, uh, which when you start, you know, cipher fibered manifolds are pretty simple. But once you start, you know, glomming together cipher fibered manifolds along uh, along tori, you can get some pretty complicated behavior, and it turns out to be true for all of them. Uh, and the proof is, more or less, you calculate all three things and observe that you get the same answers. It's not um, um, another. Another uh, example uh, result um, uh, that I proved uh, this year with Mark Kohler combined with earlier work of Rachel Roberts uh, is about gain surgery uh, on knots in the three sphere. Suppose we have some knot in S3. Um, and suppose this Alexander polynomial uh, has a simple root on the unit circle. Uh, and there's some technical hypothesis here, uh, which I will uh, say nothing more about. Uh, then uh, there exists uh, an epsilon greater than zero, so that conjecture holds for all Dane surgeries on K uh, along slopes which are in the interval from minus epsilon to epsilon. So kind of near the longitude, uh, the conjecture for fillings that are, sorry, for surgeries that are near the longitude, uh, the, conjecture, the conjecture holds. Um, and this condition that there's a simple root of the unit circle is uh, in practice, very common. So if you look at like knots through 16 crossings, something like 80% of them have a simple root on the unit circle. So this is, this is giving many examples of, of manifolds for which this thing is true. Uh, there's also important work on branch covers by uh, Cameron Gordon, Ty Lidman, Antron, um, and others. This is just two uh, sort of sample results. So, uh, much of the work that people has done, the stuff preceding this, was on, on graph manifolds. So when I started looking at this, I, I'm also, as you know well, uh, someone comes from kind of the Thurston hyperbolic school of three manifolds. Uh, so I decided I would look at uh, a few hyperbolic rational homology spheres, uh, where a few it means a quarter million. And uh, so these are constructed by taking twofold uh, branch covers over non-alternating links in the three sphere with at most 15 crossings. Uh, I insist on non-alternating because another uh, theorem that probably I should have put in this list is that any two-fold branch cover over an alternating link satisfies the conjecture. 
Or, well, okay, no, now I remember why I didn't put it in. It, it satisfies part of the conjecture. It satisfies this part. That's not known to satisfy. Uh, oh, then it does, yeah, never mind. It satisfies the conjecture. Um, so, just took these, these links with 15 crossings. I think there's on the order of half a million of them, something like that. You look at all the two-fold branch covers. You throw out the ones that are not hyperbolic because I'm prejudiced. Um, and then you're left with this 265,000 of them. Um, and so here's just some plots uh, to give you a sense of the scale of these things. Uh, you remember my first talk, I had manifolds whose volumes were in the thousands. Now I have manifolds whose volume is on average about seven. Um, uh, so they're, you know, the Weeks manifold has volume 0.94, so these are not, these are not huge things. This is just a histogram of their volumes. I have no idea why it looks so nice and kind of like normal here, and there's like this linear ramp on that side. Beats me. Um, the injectivity came up in both of my other talks, so I included a, a plot of the injectivity radius of these manifolds. It's kind of a nice looking distribution. OK, so what did I find? Uh, well, as I said, I mean, sometimes I try to give this talk and preserve the narrative tension about, you know, do I find an example or not? But I never, it never really works very well. So I just started this one by saying I don't know. I, I failed. Um, so here's the accounting of my failure. So of these manifolds, 73% uh, of them are L spaces. 27% of them are not L spaces. Um, of the L spaces, so we have one theorem here, right? So if we are an L space, you're no taught foliation. So that's why there's no mention of foliations on this side. They definitely have uh, no top foliations. And of the 100% of the total, I was able to show 44% of them have non-orderable fundamental group. Um, and so this is about 60% of the L spaces. Now, when I'm doing this, I don't, I don't uh, assume the conjecture. So I, I went through all quarter million of these guys and tried to show each one of them was non-orderable. And I succeeded a lot of the time. Um, and it just so happens that every time I succeeded, it was over here. Uh, and amongst the non-L spaces, um, I was able to, which is 27% of the total, on 24% of the total, I was able to find one of these top foliations. Um, and uh, so this is about 90% of the stuff in this column. I, this is all visually accurate to within a percent or something. And I also looked for trying to uh, show three manifold group these three manifolds are orderable, I was able to succeed uh, you know, a little over 3% of the time. Um, and all of those ended up over here. So are there questions? So what I want to talk about in, in the last 20 minutes is just some of the techniques that I use to try to compute, uh, to compute these things. Um, so yes? They haven't been found to be taught. So the thing is, okay. the thing I should say is that, with the exception, none of the things involved are easy to compute. Um, and uh, I mean, Hagar floor homology is algorithmically computable. And I chose specifically these manifolds because it's relatively easy to compute it there. It's not known whether you can decide algorithmically if a three manifold group is orderable. Um, and uh, there is an algorithm for checking if something has a top foliation and it's utterly unimplementable. So all of these things are using, well, except for the Hagar floor thing, are, are using various tricks and heuristics and so on. So this just means I went looking for top foliations by a method that I'll, I'll tell you about. Um, and I succeeded here. But it doesn't mean these don't have it. It just means I haven't succeeded yet. Yeah. So give the computers a few more years to run. They, they, We'll find more. So the part I wanted to, the test I wanted to talk the most about today was how to find these top foliations. So the, in particular, I found almost 64,000 of them. And um, the top foliation is kind of very kind of floppy, dynamical thing. Um, I was able to find a sort of simple combinatorial certificate which guarantees you have a top foliation. Uh, 
And so the certificate has the form of a triangulation of y. So the triangulation is only one vertex, so it's not simplicial. It, I just mean like a CW complex obtained from a bunch of tetrahedra by gluing their faces in pairs. Um, and then I define this notion of a laminar orientation on the triangulation. So it's an orientation on the edges uh, where every, e every face is acyclic. So every face looks like this. Uh, there's no cycle. Um, and I'm going to call this edge here, which is special, I'm going to call that the long edge. And if you have one of these acyclic orientations, then up to homeomorphism, every tetrahedra looks like this. There's a unique source, and then stuff goes up from that and ends up in a unique sink. Um, and in this picture of the tetrahedra, there's one edge that's kind of special, which in my picture is the back one. Um, it's the only edge which is long in both of the adjacent faces. Right, so this back face here, you can see this thing's the long edge um, as, you have, as you have here. Uh, whereas, say, this front face, the long edge is this, uh, but that's actually short on the back face. So since it's the only thing made of two long edges, I'm going to creatively call it very long. So the second condition is something about the very long edges. It says if you pick any edge in your triangulation, of course, there are many different tetrahedra coming down to it. Um, and condition B is just that in one of those tetrahedra, your edge is this very long edge. And then the last thing, slightly more complicated to explain, is there is an equivalence relation on faces, um, which is generated by the, a rule, I'll say in a second. And the third condition is that this Equivalence relation has a single equivalence class. So the equivalence relation is if I have two faces uh, which appear in this picture exactly as this face, the top face, and this back face. So uh, these guys here, um, these guys are meeting on their short edges. Right? So this edge here is short both in this top triangle uh, and in this back triangle. And if two faces meet like that in some tetrahedra, I declare them to be equivalent. Um, and also, uh, the same thing, this bottom face here meets this back face along an edge which is short in both, and so I'm going to declare uh, those two faces to be equivalent. So you take the equivalence relation generated by that, um, and part three is, for whatever reason, that uh, there's only one equivalence class. So this is surely completely unmotivated, but it's certainly a combinatorial thing. I could hand you a triangulation with this data, and you could go through and check, check one to three. Um, and then the theorem that I proved is that if you have a triangulation with one of these laminar orientations, then in fact it must have a taut foliation. Uh, so back here, these 64,000 hyperbolic manifolds, they're ones where I could by just searching around, find a triangulation with this kind of additional combinatorial data. So just to say, uh, where does this come from? So this is a picture of my um, tetrahedron with its standard, standard orientation. Uh, and then you use this, inside this standard picture, you put the following object, uh, this thing here. This is what's called a branch surface. So it's something that locally, uh, I should draw a picture over here. So it's a two complex, but it's like if you've seen uh, train tracks on surfaces, right? You have something like. Like this, so it's a trivalent graph, but at every vertex, there's sort of a, a well-defined tangent line here. So stuff, stuff goes like this, and you, know, you use these to describe curves on the surface or measured laminations. Um, the three-dimensional analog of this is what's called a branch surface. And um, so it's something that looks like, okay, it might look like here's one piece, 
And then you have another piece kind of coming off it. So far I just drew what looked like a, a train track cross R. Um, but then maybe I have another piece coming off like this. So there's this triple, triple intersection here. And a branch surface is just something whose worst singularity looks like this. Uh, and so the rule is you take this laminar orientation and you stick inside each tetrahedron a little, a little branch surface. Um, and if you look at what it looks like on the faces, you always see this picture. So of course there's another tetrahedron glued to this face and another one glued there. Um, and these red, these little pictures, they all match up because in each, each triangle they just look like this. So this builds a branch surface in your three manifold. Uh, and I mean, these branch surfaces have been used since the work of, of Gabay uh, to study foliations. Um, and in particular, there's a port result of Tao Li. Uh, which says if you have a branch surface satisfying certain combinatorial conditions, uh, then it carries a, a lamination. Or let me just say, it carries a taut foliation. And these two conditions here are set up so that they map you know, over to, to Tau's um, laminar conditions. Maybe I won't say what those actually are. No questions? Okay. So I have a bunch of data which um, seems to confirm the conjecture. I guess is why I've now started like proving theorems in its direction with Mark Kohler. Um, if it's not true, I continue to believe this, um, it certainly is close to true. And so if you're going to find a counterexample, you have to do something more clever than what I did, which is just go out on the street, round up 2,500 hyperbolic <laughs> manifolds, and, and look at them one by one. You sort of want to find manifolds that are borderline with respect to these properties. It's a little weird to say that, because after all, it's a zero, one thing. You have a top foliation, you don't. But, um, so I have all this data. It's not big data, I think. It's just medium data. Um, and so I tried to figure out, you know, were there any sort of useful patterns um, that allow you, for example, to predict in advance, is the thing going to have a top foliation or not? Um, uh, and so I you know, applied various regression machine learning algorithms on this data. And there's basically one interesting pattern that I found. Uh, and that is that the, the size of the first homology increases increases the odds that uh, y is an, an L space. Um, so, and actually for reasons I don't understand at all, it's better to actually to look at the first homology divided by the, by the volume. Uh, I looked at all sorts of things like the injectivity radius and how complicated a presentation for the fundamental group is and how many generators you need for the Hagar for homology chain complex and all these things. And really the only sort of significant thing is that um, this ratio here is a very strong predictor of whether or not you're in L space. Um, so this is just a histogram here of the ratio of the size of the homology to the volume. So on average, it's about 33. Um, the, this amount of torsion, in, you know, I guess I should relate this back to my first talk. Um, the amount of torsion here, and these are always torsion groups because these are rational homology spheres, these are often quite big. You know, like, you know, 500, 600, something like that. Even though these manifolds are pretty simple. And uh, so then if you look at, this is a plot of, so on this axis is this ratio, the, basically the amount of homology. Um, and then, so let's say I look at manifolds where this ratio is about 15. The dot here represents that amongst those manifolds where the ratio is 15, uh, about 50% of them are L spaces and 50% of them are not. Right. So down here, the integral homology spheres, the ones for which the homolo first homology is honestly zero, uh, none of them were L spaces. That's actually consistent with a conjecture. So there's a, a conjecture that the only integral homology three spheres which are L spaces um, are S3 itself uh, and the Poincaré homology sphere. But anyway, then as you increase this ratio, this thing just kind of increases nicely. Um, and once you get to uh, the ratio of 40, the manifolds are always, always in L space. 
And that's not because, I mean, it's not like we don't have any manifolds out here. Right? Everything with this ratio bigger than 40 is everything out here in my, all those manifolds, like 30% of them or something. Um, so that seems pretty weird. It's, it's so strong that if you take one of my manifolds and you're willing to tell me the size of its first homology group, I can predict with 90% accuracy whether or not it's an L space. Oh, and this is just a sort of another chart uh, to actually show uh, the HF hat, Hagar floor homology. So on this axis, we have the, the um, size of the first homology. On this axis, we have the size of the Hagar floor homology. Right, so the fact I started with at the beginning is you always have more floor homology than size of H1. But you always have to lie above the line y equals x here. Um, and in fact, I, I erased everything with the line y equals x, because that was 73% of them. I just looked at the ones that are not L spaces. Uh, and then for each one, you put a little point, but then you know, that's too many points for you to read. Um, and so this is like a density, a density plot. So when the, in other words, when the, you had an integral homology sphere, volume zero, then the amount of floor homology that you had I had dimension between, well, about 5 or something up to about 50. And it's kind of centered in here. Um, and so as you increase, not only, I mean, as you increase things, you do increase the amount of Hagar floor homology you have, but you do so somehow more slowly than the slope of this line. Um, and so eventually you've got nothing left. And you're all only, the, only the L spaces remain. So, so this was all the, the, from the examples that you built with Max, right? That's right, so exactly. Is there a known way, theoretically, to build something that is small H1 but very large? Uh, not uh, a formality, or is that? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, definitely. Um, so for example, uh, just take like 1 over n surgery and the figure 8 not where n is really big. Um, and then. Just to say a couple words about the, uh, the methods used for the other things. Um, the reason I work with these two full branch covers is while it is a theorem that computing Hagar floor is algorithmic, um, there's actually not, you can't go in, on the internet and find an implementation of this, uh, except in the case where you're a two full branch cover. So there's this whole beautiful theory of what's called bordered floor homology. Um, so I've, floor, Hagar floor homology, it's a 3 plus 1 dimensional TQFT. So associated to a 3 manifold, you get a vector space. Associated with a 4 manifold, you get, um, which is an ordinary 4 manifold, you just get a number. And so associated to it, you know, if you want to compute something for 3 manifolds, you want some kind of gluing theorem. Like your manifold is divided into two pieces along a surface. And you want some kind of invariant of the manifolds with boundary that lives in the surface and some kind of way to combine them. Uh, and so such a thing does exist. Um, the thing that you associate with a surface is what well, has to be more complicated than a vector space. So it's some kind of differential graded algebra. Um, I'm probably supposed to say the word A infinity in there somewhere. Don't quote me on it. So beautiful theory developed by Lipschitz, Oddfoss, and Thurston. And its simplest case is for two full branch covers of links in S3. Somehow that's the simplest case, and Bo Hajan implemented it. Um, and so you can just use it to compute, to compute all those ranks of the Hagar floor homology. Uh, and then, in general, deciding if, uh, deciding if a group has this left order, I mean, as a question about finitely presented groups, it's undecidable. I mean, basically any question about finitely presented groups is undecidable. Uh, in the context of three manifolds, it might well be decidable. Three manifolds are very, very special. I mean, that's one of the big outputs of geometrization. They're residually finite, for example. That's not something a typical group has. Uh, but we don't actually, we don't know of, a, of an algorithm to do this. So um, to sort of show groups are non-orderable, you, you basically do some kind of brute force thing. You look at the Cayley graph of your group out to some radius, 
Of course, it's a hyperbolic group, so the number of elements of this ball grows really fast, so you can't go out to a very big radius. But anyway, you look at some chunk of your group, and then you just try to order that chunk. And if you try all possibilities and fail, it's not orderable. So that, that works more better than you might expect. Um, and then to show groups are orderable, uh, the technique that I used, almost the only technique known, is to look uh, at uh, representations to uh, Lie group SL2R. Right? This is not simply connected. Its universal cover is the Lie group SL2R tilde. Uh, and just as SL2R acts on the circle, right, as the projective line or circle at infinity in hyperbolic space, uh, PSL2R tilde acts on the real line. Um, and so, in particular, if you can find a representation to this, which lifts to this, then you get an action, an action on R. Um, and the obstruction to, to lifting from here to here, I mean, it's just some Euler class. It lives in H upper 2. It's something you can compute. So it turns out these guys have tons and tons of representations to SL2R. Uh, well, I don't know, tons. They average eight, eight such representations per, ma per manifold. Um, so for each of those guys, you can compute it, its Euler class and ask, well, can, is it zero? Um, and uh, when you do that, you succeed 7,382 times um, out of the 2.13 million representations you started with. And so you think to yourself, well, is that, is that bad? You know, is that what I would have expected? Well, knowing nothing about the situation, you might say, well, what's the odds the Euler class is 0? It's just uh, 1 over whatever the size of this finite group. Right? These are rational homology spheres. This is just point gray dual to h lower 1. Um, so you could say, well, you know, just look at the size of this. That should be your probability of lifting the Euler class. Sorry, of, of the probability of the Euler class vanishing. And then you can add up that expectation and ask yourself, so how many of these things should I expect to lift? The answer, I think, is about 8,000. Uh, and so that would be evidence that somehow the Euler class is random, except the Euler class is completely and utterly non-random. Because if it were random, I would have found tons and tons of counterexamples. So it turns out that the, the manifolds that are L spaces, they actually have slightly more SL2R representations than, than, than typical. Right? Uh, of course, they do have bigger homology. That was the, the pattern I told you, which means that the probability of lifting is much smaller. But despite that, I forget how many, how many counterexamples I expected to find, like 200, I think. Um, and so then you can ask, well, what's the probability that you don't find any counterexamples when you expect 200? Things like things overlapping as the Poisson distribution is like 10 to the minus, I don't know, 10,000 or something. Anyway, so I understand in the hard sciences they're moving away, social sciences too, moving away from the p value as like the, you know, they always want to get p value less than 0.5. I'm disappointed by this because with, with this data I get like p is equal to 10 to the minus a million or something. Like that. Anyway, so that's the story of my failure. Hopefully the, the question will interest you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? This quantity you still have on the board, the, the denominator, the, the size of uh, first yep. homology, mm -hmm. has come up over and over again. Is, is it ever useful to look more closely at that and look at the separate out by the isomorphism classes? Uh, yes, um, that, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, so far, that I've not gotten any extra mileage out of doing that. Um, I mean, the, the reason it, it comes up um, so much for the Hagar floor homology stuff is that I said HF hat is a, a group that's associated, a vector space associated with a a three manifold, which is accurate. But really, it's a, a vector space associated with each element of, of H upper 2, um, with a, well, really with a spin C structure, which is an affine module over this. So really, you actually get um, sort of this many different, uh, your, you basically, your group sort of has, your homology groups have two gradings, one of which is the sort of homological grading, 
And the other one is the spin C grading. Um, and what they show is that in each particular grading, the homology is non-zero. Um, and that's why the dimension, the total dimension, has to be at least as big as the uh, size of H2. Uh, 